Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace, blessings, and mercy of God be upon you. This is a short presentation from www.central moscom and from the Humble Heart YouTube channel. Many of you may not know that Iran, for hundreds of years, until the 1500s, was predominantly Sunni. In fact, almost all of Sunni, and they followed the Shafi'i Madhab. How in the world then today in 2020, when we're talking about and Iran is dominated with Shiaism? Let's join this journey and take a look at how it happened in history. Let me uh, tell you something when it comes to Islam. So as we know, Islam started with um, the geography, which is present day Saudi Arabia, Mecca and Medina, and then it spread throughout the world. Um, to today where there are over a billion Muslims worldwide. Islam did not come to eradicate culture, history, tradition. Islam simply says to its adherents or people who follow Islam to basically follow the teachings of Islam in their culture, in their tradition and so on and so forth. So people live in certain geographies, they are, they are a product of their evolution, of their climate, on their habitat, of their traditions. And Islam did not come to wipe that out. All Islam says is anything and everything that's in your tradition is in conformance with the teachings of Islam carries on. Otherwise, Islam says don't do that, which is in Islam, Islamic terms, the habit is called impermissible. To give you a, an, an even simpler example, we will talk about Iran in a minute. Let's consider Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and Bangladesh. Vast amounts of Muslims, they're all majority or predominantly Sunni and their majority or predominantly Hanafi. So within the within Sunni Islam, there are four schools of Islamic jurisprudence where in terms of jurisprudence, they slightly differ. The Hanafi ones are the majority throughout the world and these Muslims are not only Sunni, but in terms of jurisprudence, they are Hanafi. Yet there are distinct differences in their culture. So the, the culture of, of a Muslim from Bangladesh is different to a culture of a Muslim in Afghanistan and there's no problem with that as far as Islam is concerned. They can both coexist side by side. Why is that? Because in Islam the, there are twin pillars that safeguard the ad adherence of Muslims to Islam. The two pillars are the Quran, the Book of Allah, and the Sunnah, which is basically the practice of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companions. There are ulama, scholars, who continuously evaluate you know, the, the situations that Muslims encounter in a particular society, they revert back to the twin pillars, the Quran and the Sunnah, and the tradition continues. So if so, Muslims go back to them, for example, in 2020, if Muslims come across a new problem, I don't know, for example, digital currency. So they will go to their ulama and they say, can we use this digital currency? Is it permissible in Islam? These scholars, ulama, will dig into the Quran and the Sunnah and they will issue a ruling whether digital currency is permissible for you to use or not permissible for you to use. And it continues on and on and on. And this is how distilling happens. Now, we have ulama in 2020. Their predecessors previously did exactly the same thing. When it comes to Sufism, the same thing is supposed to happen. So you have, uh, you know, Muslim scholars who are Sufis or even Sufis who are not Muslim scholars. They go back and they continuously check this, their practices with the Quran and the Sunnah and they distill it. Uh, and so everything has to keep going back to the original Islam or as close as possible to the original Islam, which was brought by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. However, in Islamic history, we find instances where they, there's degeneration or departure from this practice. So what happens is a Sufi order established, which is based on the twin pillars of Quran and the Sunnah. But then slowly the distilling back or referring back to the Quran and the Sunnah is loosened until it is disconnected. Then what happens is the head of the Sufi order becomes the overall authority. So the authority is meant to be the Quran and the Sunnah. Instead, the head of that Sufi order becomes the authority. And that then becomes a cult. It is no longer part of Islam. When it comes to um, many people in the West, they look at certain practices of Sufi orders within Islam and they think that that's Sufism is identified by certain practices. It's not. A lot of those practices have 
little to do with the Quran and the Sunnah. But this, these are how cults develop. A particular personality is focused rather than the doctrine which is based on the Quran and the Sunnah. And this, uh, and this is important for you to understand before we talk about what happens to Iran. Now, one more thing from history. Uh, a lot of you know the media and the Western world continuous, continuously refers to Iran as somehow the successor of the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was huge and no doubt it was sophisticated in terms of, of knowledge and art and culture and so on and so forth, but it was vast. It touched borders of modern day China, included even some parts of China, to, and, and touched uh, uh, when, as you travel westwards, it touched the borders of Europe. It was huge and in, indeed contributed to human evolution and evolution of our culture and our sciences and technology as we know of today. Iran was a small part of that Persian Empire. The modern day Iran was a small part of it. The Persian Empire was massive compared to what is modern day Iran. However, the people of Iran still have this aspiration of the Persian Empire. They they see themselves uh, as the as the basically the 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 uh, somehow they want to you know ascribe themselves to the old Persian Empire, which is great and gigantic and massive, and it still sits in their memory. Now, so as I told you, I'm going to skip the discussion as to how Islam came to Iran. Um, just take it as a fact for right now that for hundreds of years until the 1500s 1500s iran was predominantly sunni and it followed the shafi school of thought so remember i told you that basically the sunni islam has four uh, jurisprudence juris, schools of jurisprudence the majority is hanafi which basically in, in india pakistan bangladesh afghanistan parts of russia and so on uh, the iranis on the other hand were sunnis but they followed uh, the, the shafi school of jurisprudence and that's fine then what happens is this sheikh, this scholar comes along and his name was Sheikh Safiuddin Ishaq Ardabili and he establishes the Safavi Sufi order. So he was a scholar and he was a Shafi and he, he establishes the Sufi order. Now one of the practices in the Sufi order is renouncing the world and actually living a very simplistic life and not having any political ambitions and so on. And the Sheikh Safiuddin Ishaq Ardabili who is from Ardabil, Iran was fine. He established the Sufi order, he's fine. But by the time his, after he passes away, his son takes over as a successor and after his son, his grandson takes over. The problems begin with his grandson. His grandson actually had political ambitions. And because in order to achieve his political ambitions, he begins to adopt certain aspects of Twelver Shias. Twelver Shias are one of the most extreme sects of Shia. So he begins to adopt that. Then the, so the Sufi order, the, the connection to the twin pillars of the Quran and the Sunnah breaks and it begins to deteriorate until the seventh successor, which is Shah Ismail the first. This guy is full blown 12 er Shia. He's no longer Sunni and he's no longer Shafi. He is 12 er Shia. Other um, adherents of the Sufi tariqa, they begin to have a militaristic aspect to it and their soldiers that this tariqa develops and they're called Qazalbash. Qazalbash is basically this red top, this peculiar red hat and they were identified by this red hat. So this tariqa now has two things. It has doctrine, which is 12 or Shia and it has diehard extremist soldiers, which are basically Qazalbash and others, which are also 12 or Shias. Shah Ismail in 1500s, so his sheikh was from here, from Ardabil. He actually captures Baku, present day Baku, and he comes downwards all the way, capturing lands until he captures this important city of that time, Tabriz, which is in present day Iran, and he makes it the capital of his Safavi dynasty. So the di in order to formulate a dynasty, you need two things. You need ideology and you need a force. So he's got both. He's got the, the, the ideology, which is basically... 12 are Shias, which are different because all of this area, remember, a Sunni and their Shafi. So he creates a new ideology and he's got soldiers which are ruthless and he comes down and he does that. Now, on the border are the Ottomans. The Ottomans are Sunni. The Ottomans are, uh, are basically disturbed by these developments along their border. Why? For two reasons. One is because 
Ottomans are also an empire, so they're threatened by another empire developing. And secondly, this empire is alien to what the Ottomans are practicing, which is Sunnism. So over the next hundreds of years, there are many skirmishes between the Ottomans and the and the um, Shias. And this area, the, the capital Tabriz, within the lifetime of Shah Ismail, changes hands. It goes Ottomans, then back to he conquers it back, and so on and so forth. Now, you need to understand something. The Ottomans are predominantly Sunni. All of these areas are Sunni and they're Shafi. Why would a Sunni fight a Sunni? It makes no sense. So what this guy Shah Ismail does, he realizes that quite early on. So he realizes that he needs to create a culture of us versus them in order to fight the Ottomans. So the easiest way he can do that is he, he starts to force Twelver Shiaism into the Sunni area. So the Ottomans are now not only racially different, ethnically different, but also ideologically different because the Ottomans are Sunnis and we are Twelver Shias. In order to achieve that, he does a number of things. The first thing he does, he, he assassinates Sunni ulama in massive numbers. So as I told you, the ulama are supposed to be checking the twin pillars of Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah, making sure traditions and stuff comply to the prophetic times, he starts killing these and assassinating the Sunni ulamas in large numbers. Then, Iran has a well-established network of mosques and education institutes which produce these ulamas. He destroys them all. So not only the ulama are killed, the institutes, the factories which produce the product, is also destroyed then what he does he starts force converting the sunnis into shiism so you either convert to shiism or you're killed tortured or expelled from these lands then he begins the ritual cursings of the caliphs and the earliest companions of prophet muhammad peace be upon him these earliest companions and the closest companions of prophet muhammad peace be upon him they occupy a special stature and rank in the eyes of Sunni Muslims. He starts ritual cursing of it. What is he doing? He's creating an ideological difference for political reasons. Then, now, all the, 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 the a large number of Sunni ulama are killed, their mosques are destroyed, caliphs are being cursed openly. So he has a problem. Now he has to generate scholars. He has none because, as, as I told you, Iran was predominantly Sunni and Shafi. So what he does, he encourages Arab Shia scholars to come and migrate into his lands. He gives them incentives. He gives them honorific titles um, and, and positions in his, in his dynasty. And he also begins to encourage migration from other parts, for example, Azerbaijan and stuff, which had Shia aspects, to migrate into his land. This Safavi dynasty ra lasts 200 years. For 200 years, there is forced conversions of Sunnis to Shiaism in large numbers. Now, this guy was extreme, Shah Ismail. Uh, you know, some of in the dynasty were not as extreme. Nevertheless, the, the preaching and the forced conversion of Shiaism continues for 200 years, completely altering the dynamics and the demographics of Iran. 200 years later, this new, the dynasty is on its knees, it's weakened, and this guy comes along, his name is Nadir Shah. He was a 12-er Shia himself, but he had triple problems. One, he was fighting the Safavid dynasty, which he was trying to take over. Second was Ottomans continuously were fighting and, and, and trying to take over these lands. And then a lot of his soldiers actually come from Afghanistan, which are Sunnis. So... Not only he's a brilliant soldier, he's also a brilliant politician. So he goes to the Ottomans and he said, listen, we don't want to be this extreme anymore. We are Shias, but we don't want to be this extreme. Then he also tries to take people. He has to make people rise away, rise against a 200-year-old dynasty. And then he also has Sunni soldiers. So he introduces this Jafari Madhab into Iran. Now, as I told you, the Sunnis have four different schools of jurisprudence which are the Hanafis, Shafis, Malikis and Hanbalis. He introduces this Jafari Mazhab as the fifth one and this effort continues to this day. So basically there's a lot of a lot of um, you know Muslims and stuff, modern Muslims who ta who say look Islam doesn't have four schools of jurisprudence, it actually has five. Nadir Shah was the first one who introduced that politically in Iran because 
he wanted to have you know uh, he wanted to stop the ottomans from attacking his areas he wanted to to basically pacify the sunni soldiers and he wanted people to differentiate between him and the safavi dynasty nadir shah was a great ruler of iran but after he died the 12 shias take over and the same um, continues even to this day so this is the reason why this guy right here shah ismail who was the seventh successor of the safavi sufi order he basically force converted sunnis of iran into shiaism unofficially there are about 30, 30 to 35% of the population of iran is still sunni nevertheless officially you never see that so the media doesn't mention it and so on and so forth in fact um pakistan for example Pakistan is Shia population. Iran has probably two times more the population of Sunnis than they are in Shias in Pakistan. However, there is absolutely no representation of it on any level whatsoever. Okay, um, and this is this is how uh, Shiaism was forced uh, forced upon the Sunnis of Iran. Otherwise, when you read the history of Iran from 1500s and previously, there were some, some great scholars who came from Iran, which were basically Sunnis. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.